Hey there. So, I want to talk about the next step regarding the big sins. <laughs> uh, that really resonated with some people. You know, I actually, when I first shared it, uh, the big sins message, I left it unlisted. I just thought it might be too heavy for people. It might be, it might put people under condemnation or introspection. I don't know. But when I put it on public, uh, I, it really seemed to resonate with people. Um, so big sins are when you've made a mess. I mean, the consequences of big sins are that you make big messes. Um, what's next? <laughs> because let's say you're wanting to come back to the Lord now, or, you know, you're seeing that the grace of God is for you, but you're also seeing your life is full of consequences. Uh, this is the next step <laughs> is to recognize the sovereignty of God. Uh, as you're being reconciled to him. Now, that doesn't mean that there's a problem between him and you. But remember when Paul wrote to the Corinthians uh, who were in a mess, he said, we, you know, God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation and we're ambassadors for him. And we're begging you to be reconciled. Now, these are reconciled people. These are believers who have peace with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Paul is reminding them that God is for them. Right? He is for them. They, if they are, if they need to be reconciled, it's in their mind. Now, actually, all of us need to be reconciled in our mind. And that's called... Setting your mind on the things of the Spirit or walking in the Spirit. Some people have asked me now, well, how do I walk in the Spirit? And I've, uh, I teach on this stuff, so if it's repetition, please bear with me. But to walk in the Spirit in Romans 8 is simply to agree with the things the Spirit bears witness to rather than agreeing with the spirit of bondage and fear. Spirit of bondage and fear comes with the law, which is a set of accusations against you. The law tells you all the things you shouldn't do and have done, probably, or the t tells you all the things you should do and haven't done, and therefore it's a record against you. And it comes with an accusation and a demands a wage, which is death. Okay, to agree with that is to shrink back from God. And say, this is my lot, you know. I might as well keep doing the sin because I'm a slave to it. Uh, it's got a hold on me and I owe the flesh. I'm a debtor to the flesh. Even though the Bible says uh, that God crucified the old man, you died to sin. You died to the law. That sin shall not rule over you because you're no longer under the law, but under grace. Okay, uh, so it's contrary to the truth to believe those things, which can be very hard when you are stuck in big people's sins. <laughs> because big people's sins don't just affect your own conscience, they affect the life of everybody around you. Okay, so we need to get over to be reconciled to God. And that really means our mind, which was alienated through God, through wicked works, uh, alienated to God through wicked works, before we were saved and then when we're doing wicked works, our mind is alienated. The mind of the flesh is carnal, it is unable to be subject to God's law, it is hostile to him. So we need to be reconciled, and the place to be reconciled is in our mind. And that is to agree with the truth of the gospel and of God's position. That's the first thing is to, you know, the, the adulterous woman went through a process where Jesus showed her the truth. Where are, your, where are those who condemn you? Neither do I condemn you. She had to see that. 
Uh, and that would have been a change of mind for her because she thought she was going to die. She thought she was going to be stoned. She thought the Pharisees were going to kill her and Jesus was going to applaud them. They brought her to Jesus to see what he would do. And the righteous thing for him to do would have been to say, yep, stone her, right? According to the law. But according to the righteousness of God, Christ has been given authority to execute judgment and he's going to be the propitiation for the sins of the world. And he's Jesus the righteous. And he, in that moment, he showed her, neither do I condemn you. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And it, God is for you who can be against you. So Romans 8 is like the peak of, of all the truths in Romans uh, up to that point, obviously. And it's all good news about who's behind you and who's for you. And uh, so that's the first thing is that as you are coming to your senses, you got to you know the and and th this is where God and man meet too when you start coming back to God you start saying well it's better in my father's house if for a slave I'll, I'll practice a speech you know Lord I'm not even worthy to be a slave in your house but God's running towards you to put the robe on his plan is to put the robe on you and put bring you into the feasting house now that's a journey it's a process but that's his heart and the prodigal son's mind was changed when he saw the father running towards him with joy on his face and tears in his eyes. And that's the kind of renewal we sort of need. But because our father is invisible, we need to see it in the word. That's his witness. We need to believe what the word says. So that's why Romans 8 has comforted so many billions of people. Think about the fruit Paul has borne just from Romans 8. You know, he, the word is imperishable. And it goes out and it does God's will. It does not return to him void. And you just think, wow, how powerful is the word? Because I'm thinking about like Colossians 3, Philippians 3, Galatians 3. Why are the threes so important? Romans 3. John 3, uh, and this, Romans 8, how many people have been set free over the years, millions and millions of people, over 2,000 years, have been reconciled to God through the important peaks in these passages, you know? The, the things we do are eternal uh, when, it, when we're dealing with the word of grace. Grace is eternal. And grace is life. Grace is Christ himself. Grace is the trying God, the son as the shepherd, bringing home the lost sheep, bringing you into the house and having a party. The woman who finds the sweeps and finds the coin representing the Holy Spirit. What does she do? She finds the coin and has a party. And then the prodigal son, the father meets him. And what does he do? He has a party. So salvation in grace is the triune God working to bring you from a lost state into the party, into the feast, into the rejoicing. And that's the, what Romans 8, you see that peak in there. It starts out with there's, oh, wretched man who, that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then I thank God through Jesus Christ. There is therefore no, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then the next 10 verses or 12 verses are talking about how, okay, that's true, but you need to set your mind on the things of the Spirit. It's the same thing as Second or 1 Corinthians. Be reconciled to God. But first you have to see that his message to you is an ambassador of his position. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. And he's made us, Paul included, an ambassador of his grace, a minister of reconciliation, begging you to be reconciled to God to enjoy your position. And that is so hard when you're in the deep sins. But the prodigal did it, and the uh, the adulterous woman did it. 
Was it really them doing it? No, it was God visiting them with the truth of who he is. Jesus visited the woman by saying, where, is your, where are those who condemn you? Neither do I condemn you. And the father visited. See, in each of those parables, it's the son that goes and gets the lost sheep. And it's the woman that sweeps to find the coin. And it's the father that runs to the son that's come to its senses through the shepherding work of the son and the sweeping work of the spirit. It's the father. It's God. It's the trying God coming to you. If you could get lay hold of that, he say, I feel so lost in my sin, but I know I can't deny Jesus Christ. See, when I was lost in my sin, I couldn't escape from God. Though I make my bed in hell, there he is. That verse used to ring out to me because I was trying to run from him. I didn't want to deal with it anymore. I can't stop doing what I'm doing. And yet if I think about God, all I sense is condemnation and fear. So what am I going to do? I can't, And I can't stop thinking about him or I can't stop believing him. I can't just say it's not true. Why? Because I'm sealed with the spirit. I have the witness of the spirit in me testifying. That Jesus is the Son of God, and that he came in the flesh. I can't get away from it, and yet I can't embrace it because my mind is alienated through wicked works. So Romans 8 starts with, there's no condemnation, but it's for those who walk in the Spirit. And if you're not walking in the Spirit, you're gripped with alienation, condemnation, fear, and death. A spirit of bondage again into fear. But... In the Spirit, there is something called the Spirit of Sonship, right? Those who are led of the Spirit of God are the children of God. For you've not received a spirit of bondage to bring you again into fear, but a spirit of sonship in which you cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God and if a child and an heir. Think about that. That is the story of the prodigal son because it's, he was in the spirit of bondage and fear which is slavery terminology, and he's practicing a speech. Lord, it's not, I, if I could just be a servant in your house. I mean, I just can't survive out here. You know, I'm not worthy to do anything. Uh, and yet he's a son and an heir. What does he need? He needs his mind to be reconciled to the truth. So God throws the robe on him and gives him the ring. The father does. And what is that? That is God visiting him with the truth to renew his mind. That's, you say, how is God working in my situation when I'm in such a mess? I said in the last message, when you sin, God goes to work. Well, he can't do anything really for your joy until your mind is reconciled. And so that's why... Uh, Romans 8 says, the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. The mindset on the flesh is death. The mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Those who are according to the flesh, mind the things of the flesh. Those who are according to the spirit, mind the things of the spirit. And that is, you're either minding the lies of the flesh, the deceitfulness of sin, that tells you you have no way to have fellowship with God, you're lost. Uh, which is death. Or... You mind the things of the Spirit. What are the things of the Spirit? Well, they're the things that the Spirit bears witness to. I'm a son and an heir, and God is for me. Now, there's nothing you can do to remedy your situation. All the riches are in the Father's house, and in your situation, you seem to be outside the house. That's how it was for the prodigal son, right? Until he got in the house, there's, you know, he's still hungry, he's still dissatisfied. And he's not in the house. He's on the road. Even if he does have the robe in the ring. What is the robe in the ring? It's the representation of Christ's righteousness and the seal of the Spirit. Which is given to him as a token gesture, right? A pledge of the inheritance that's in the house. But he does have a journey to get into the house. Um, and that journey, once he has the ring, once he agrees, okay, even though... And this is very difficult... Even though I am what I am, and my life is what it is, and the people around me have suffered what they've suffered, and I've just asked the Lord, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Just kill me. I've prayed that before. Just kill If, if I'm going to keep sinning like this, just kill me. 
you know, I, there's, all I'm doing is reaping corruption. There's no point in me being alive. I'm damaging everything and I can't stop. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Then through the grace of God, somehow he got it through to me that there's forgiveness in Jesus. He, you know, he pointed me to Christ and him on the cross and showed me God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And I saw at some level, again, a reminder on the righteousness of God in Christ. Yet it was so hard to believe, really. But the other scripture he gave me is that the bruised reed he won't break and the smoking flax he won't quench. And that means he deals with you tenderly, knowing that you are fragile. And he will keep visiting you and visiting and visiting you with that truth, even if you continue to sin. And even if everybody around you who's a Christian can't fellowship with you, you are never alone. Somehow, though, the only answer for your peace and your joy and to get back into walking in the Spirit is to have a change of mind about your position in Christ and actually embrace it. And then the prodigal, from that point of the journey on, see, up to, the, up to when the father met up with him and threw the robe on his shoulders and gave him the ring, he was walking alone in the spirit of bondage of fear, practicing his speech about how he was going to, you know, if I'm, uh, I, it's not even, if I could just be a servant in your house, and he's rehearsing his speech. Then the father throws the robe on him, hugs him, gives him the ring, and now he's walking together with the father back to the house. So this, at least... You know, maybe the maybe the son was completely confused about what was going on at this point. The father just had to overwhelm him. But his rehearsed speech stopped and he was reminded that he's an heir. And, you know, that robe, again, is the righteousness of Christ, which justifies and positions you as a member of the house, a citizen, you know, with the rights. And the ring says, yeah, and he's the heir. Uh, that This guy is not destined for slavery. But you might not believe it. You know, maybe the maybe the son thought, okay, the father hugged me and he's all happy, but when I get into the house, he's going to beat the living crap out of me. <laughs> uh, who knows? But on the way, the father would have been speaking encouragement to him. I'm so glad you're back. You were dead. You know, oh, I'm so glad to see you. Affirming him, affirming him, affirming him. The witness of the spirit. That you are a child and an heir. We need that on our journey. And in our journey, we're weak. And so Romans 8 goes from the mindset on the flesh is death to the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. And then those who are led of the spirit of God are the children of God, for you've not received a spirit of bondage again into fear, but a spirit of sonship in which we cry, Abba, Father, is around verse 14. Uh, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and heirs, co-heirs with Christ. And if you understand Christ's inheritance, that's why we've been studying the covenants and understanding that, you know, David, the seed of David has an inheritance and we're co-heirs with him. You know, you have no idea, but that your position is secure, you know, and uh, we're co-heirs with Christ of all things. That's what the spirit is bearing witness to. And just like the father is probably telling him, no, no, you're not going to be a servant in my house. Come on. You're gonna, I'm going to make a feast for you. Uh, did he deserve it? No. Did he do anything to earn it? No. But in order to enter the enjoyment, he still had to have his mind changed a little bit about the father, or he would have been in fear that whole journey, and then he wouldn't have had any appetite when he got to the house. doesn't matter if the father makes a feast if he's terrified. He's going to cook me next, you know. Uh, anyway, Romans 8 goes on. Because here we're in weakness, and it's hard for us to believe. Well, after he tells us the spirit of sonship is in us, bearing witness that with our spirit that we are children of God, he tells us this, that this spirit helps us in our weakness. For we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the spirit intercedes with groanings that cannot be uttered. And we are familiar with this groaning. On the one hand, it is a groaning because of the futility of the flesh and the weakness and the difficulty to believe in the midst of all of our situation. Are crying out, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death at the end of chapter 7, actually probably springs from the 
interceding of the spirit in our weakness. But it's also a general sense of futility that this age is not for me. I, nothing in it satisfies. It, it all turned out to ruin, you know. This is a change of mind that's happening on a journey. First, seeing there's no condemnation. Second, seeing that I am reconciled to God and I'm an heir, right? And also seeing that nothing in this life satisfies and that I'm so weak that it's hard for me to believe that I'm an heir. So it's hard for me to enter into the joy of the one good thing that I have, which is my salvation. Jesus is there along the way. The Father is there along the way. The Jesus is bearing you home as the shepherd, and the Father is walking along with you. You know, you got to put those parables together. Jesus got the lost sheep and carried him home on his shoulders. And while he's doing that, the Father's walking with the prodigal, telling him about his inheritance, encouraging him. And the Spirit is sweeping for that lost coin. See, what... The reason we went into sin and fell into it all is because we lost something. We lost the joy of our salvation and the sense of our inheritance through lack of knowledge and bad doctrine, usually. And the Spirit has to sweep all that out. That's all part of the journey. He does it through the intercession. Then he starts talking about that the, the whole universe is subject to futility because of the groaning waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And then he starts talking about the predestination of the sons of God, that all things work together for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also called, those he called, he justified, those he justified, he glorified. It's past tense, it's guaranteed, it's secure. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Life or death, angels, myself, my sin, nothing the love of god in christ and so that's why i know all things work together for good and he leads me in triumph and you know and the so the peak in romans 8 is the feast at the end of romans 8 there's a feast the rejoicing he hits is higher i i don't think i see i see in philippians uh the rejoicing of paul in paul but here i see the rejoicing in God because of his wondrous grace, which takes wretches like me and sets me up in the heavens and gives me a feast, right? But there was a journey to get there. And there's a journey in your Christian life to reach the peak of joy. And that peak of joy is your strength. Uh, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And that is the feast he's prepared for us in the presence of our enemies. It comes from a reconciled mind that agrees with, uh, not right now, I'll, I'll talk to you when I'm done. Okay, I can't, I can't do $2 though. No, we're, I, I'll, I'll talk to you when I'm done. We need to set some limits on this. I'll talk to you in a minute. Okay, uh, sorry. This is something where we need to agree the, the path is to be reconciled to God and to agree with the things the Spirit bears witness to, which is so hard, which is why we need the high priest. It's the same thing as in Hebrews. They're staggering back and forth between the promises of God and unbelief and temptation to go back to religious works and or just wallow in their sin. They've got a high priest and an anchor within the uh, for their soul, within the presence, within the veil. And their high priest is interceding for them in their weakness. What weakness? This weakness that makes it so hard for us to believe that God is for us. In spite of all of this. Okay. Now the next thing is once you get a glimpse of your justification. And you can kind of grasp it. Here's the key, I believe, to really reconciling yourself to God. See, you live in your situation every day. And your situation, if it's a mess, is contrary, seemingly, to the will of God. So you think you're out of the will of God, right? But that's where Paul takes us in Romans 8, is to the predestination of the sons. Now, Calvinism has ruined predestination for many people. They don't want to be Calvinists, so, that, so if you say predestination, they think you're being a Calvinist, and then it shuts down right there. And so they miss a crucial element of their security in Christ. 
The sons are heirs of something called predestination. Only sons are predestinated. Um, predestination is not unto salvation. It's presented as predestination unto sonship and inheritance. It is the fact that God knew you from the foundation of the world in Christ. He chose you in him. He foreknew you in him. And predestinated you unto sonship according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace in which he made you accepted in the beloved, in whom you have redemption and the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, right? And he's putting his grace on display in you. And that is predestination. Predestination is all the things that God works in time and space to make sure that the sons are brought into their inheritance. And that literally means everything. Because remember in Ephesians, at the end of Ephesians 1, it talks about spirit of wisdom. God, Paul prays that you have a spirit of wisdom and revelation, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. See, you're his inheritance too. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? It talks about the working of the strength of his might which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Seated him at his right hand in the heavenlies, far above all principality and power. Every name that is named, both in this world and the world to come. And has given him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. What's he saying? He's saying that Christ has authority. We know that Christ has authority over everything, but why? For the church, to the church. He's head over all things to the church. And according to Ephesians 1, I think 10, 11, 13, I don't know. He is working all things according to the good pleasure of his will, or the counsel of his will. And what is that? To produce the masterpiece of God, to bring the sons of God into their inheritance they are predestinated to be conformed to the image of Christ and glorified, and he's going to bring them there one way or another. And what that means for a son of God and an heir is that everything in my life is according to God's sovereign will. And this is, you know, it's not Calvinism because the Calvinist says, you know, you aren't getting saved and therefore that's God's will. No, God's will is for everybody to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But for those who do come to the knowledge of the truth, it turns out that they were foreknown and chosen in Christ. They're known in Christ. They're not known in Adam. They're known in Christ. How can they not be? They're members of his body. And God is showing forth the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness to them in the ages to come in Christ. And he's doing that as the one who sees all things, the end from the beginning. He's already spent that time. How can he not know you? Of course he knows you. He doesn't love you with just the general love with which he loves the world. He loves you as a member of the body of Christ, accepted in the beloved. A co he, the, with the love that he loves the Son. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. In the same way, with the same love. And it's an eternal love. I've loved you with an everlasting love. We just can't get our mind around it. His mercies are from eternity to eternity to the righteous. He knows us. That's the whole privilege. Is not that we know God, but that he's known of us is what puts us in the position. And then we grow in the knowledge of him. And for that, he's given us a high priest to deal with us in our weakness. And he's working. See, his high priestly prayer is backed by the authority because it's a king priest. And so he has authority over all things in heaven and earth. And he's head over all things to the church. And when he prays, he has the right to do anything he wants to bring you through the journey to reconcile you to himself. And part of it is he's got to reconcile your mind. And one of the things he's got to do is let you see what the corruption of the flesh so that you'll agree with him in his judgment on the flesh and say, finally, I'm crucified with Christ. God is not expecting something from my flesh. He's expecting something from the life of Christ in me. And I need to learn to walk according to the Spirit, which is simply to agree with who God is and what he's doing and what he's said. And that has to be eventually meet my circumstances. 
where I see that my messy life and what I am with my weaknesses that has caused so much heartache for those around me and even this mess I'm in is all accounted for in the sovereignty of God and even being worked together for my good. And this is what it means to be subject to the God and to submit yourself to God and to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. And this is what it means to know his discipline and this is where we really start to know him is when we see his working in our life and acknowledge it. And the best person, I've said this before, and I'm typing my discipline messages. Actually, I need to get back to that. But one of the focuses is David because of everybody in the scripture, he shows us how to deal with discipline. When he was disciplining, being disciplined by God, that he acknowledged that God was the author of his circumstances ultimately, that he couldn't get away from God, that God was behind him, before him, and set his hand upon him, and that he was utterly dependent on the mercy of God, and yet God was for him. And even though, uh, it, and because of that, he could submit himself to everything, including the judgments of God. There was one thing where, see, he's a king, so he had special dispensation of God where he's being judged for things we wouldn't, but, uh, and he has to choose the punishment. God says, okay, you can either do this or this or this, you know. And he's like, okay, I'll, I'll choose this punishment. He, he, God made him choose the consequence. But he knows there's consequences in his life. It's called, well, you made your bed, you had to lie in it kind of thing. Yeah, in a way, I did make my bed. But God made it first. There ha and th you know, so this is the ultimate understanding of grace. And it sounds like a license to sin. But where sin abounded, grace is more abounded. That as sin reigned as death, uh, grace now reigns through righteousness unto eternal life. And it's because I'm an heir and because of God, not because of me. And I cannot fix my situation. I can't make it better. I can't improve myself. I can't, Im I can't stop doing the things I hate. And I can't start doing the things I want to do. I am dead to the law. I, through the law, I died to the law. And I agree with God's judgment. I'm crucified with Christ. You don't have to be super spiritual to agree with God about the judgment on the flesh. You just say, oh, wretched man, who will deliver me from the body of this death? It is a recognition that I am death. My whole, everything I do is death. And everything around me is the product of my sowing to the flesh, my whole environment. Maybe you got so bad that you lost a wife, lost a household, and then ended up in the wrong marriage. In your desperate running from God, and you had such a sense of filthiness and shame that you just shacked up with somebody because at least they accepted you. You know, and it didn't make you have to think about your sins. And then you go, well, I guess I'll just marry this person, even though you didn't want to, but you felt like you had no control over your life anymore. And so you did. And then you wake up to God and you realize you're in a bad marriage. And you married the wrong person and you never should have. And it was in your sin and your depravity. And you didn't realize how low you'd stooped. And now your whole life is the consequence right? You're in this terrible situation. Well, see, the flesh says, okay, I made a mistake. I was wrong. I'm going to get right with God and I'm going to leave this situation. No, that's going to put you back in the flesh. This situation is for your good. This situation is from God. What? Now, I'm not talking about, like, if you're being beaten by an abusive husband or something like that, you need to flee. <laughs> but I'm talking about you know, you're in a marriage, well, I, this is theoretical, and the two are believers, and you're both kind of coming back to God, but you have so many problems, you would have never married this person. Now, because you're reconciled to God, and you're submitting to him, you have to account for the fact that, yes, this is the bed I made, and I'm going to lie in it, but it's my grave. And my grave is different than the world's grave, because I'm planted in the tomb with Christ, his tomb was in a garden, and it's the planting place for resurrection. 
It's where the grain of wheat was planted so that the life can come out. See, God has an infinite number of things that he can do to turn your situation into a blessing if you can submit to him. But submitting to him is not gritting your teeth and angrily obeying God against your will. It is the final acknowledgement that I can do nothing to remedy my situation. Anything I do is just going to make it worse. Where shall I go? This is it. This is my life now. And you begin to trust God to turn everything into good. You don't even know how he's going to do it. You have no idea. But you're not going to be the one to lift your hand. That's what got you into trouble in the first place. See, most sin, the sin journey in the Christian life, the prodigal, comes from a wrong concept of God in the first place. He wanted his father dead so he could have the inheritance. That shows that he had a view of his father that he didn't understand his love. All the way up until the father put the robe on him, he didn't know his father's love. He thought God was going to make him a servant in his house. His big brother thought that that's what God wanted. You know, I'm working out here, keeping the commandments in the field. He never threw a party for me. Right? He didn't know he could have had a feast any time. So this is because we are sinners and God has to reconcile our mind and he has to let us go through whatever we have to go through until we agree. And that's more important to him than the cleanness of your life and your reputation and the, even the people around you. In Isaiah, he says a striking thing. He said, I've given many lives as a sacrifice for you <laughs> to, to, to one of his chosen he uses all things, all people, even the even the unbelievers. Now, the unbelievers are not predestined to uh, reprobation. God desires that they would be saved too. But while they're in their state of unbelief, he's using them to agitate the believers and bring them into despair. <laughs> he, he is the head over all things. Every circumstance is working together for good for the church. The devil does not rule your life, nor does your sin. If you are the Lord's purchased property and you've been redeemed, you believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the justification, everything that happens from that point on, and really everything that led you to that point, is God's will. Not that he's the author of sin. And James kind of touches on this. No, God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. And you can't say when you're tempted, I was tempted of God. No, you followed your lust. And then sin came and death was, death came, you know, because of sin. But on the other hand, God is sovereign and he's the father of lights and you're his child and you were born as a kind of first fruits of his creature, born of his will. James says that you're born of his will. And James talks about, you know, submitting yourself to God that he may lift you up. And he says, uh, uh, he, he, sa he says, and, and if you lack wisdom, ask from God who gives liberally without upbraiding. God gives you wisdom liberally without rebuking you for being a fool. You know, see, if I ask for wisdom in my mom, she'll rebuke me for being a fool first. No, you are in your sins because of your foolishness and lack of wisdom, because you lack a vision of who the Father is. Wisdom is not, how do I live my life? Wisdom is knowing Christ. That's why Paul said, he prayed that we'd have a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the full knowledge of him. In fact, all of Paul's prayers are about wisdom for us to know the Father, to bring us into rejoicing, like it says in Colossians. Being filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual understanding or wisdom. Uh, to please him in every respect. Uh, strengthened with all might unto joy, with all patience and long-suffering and joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us for the share of the allotted portion of the saints in the light. It's wisdom to know who you are in Christ. Wisdom tells me I can submit in this situation and not run from it. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm not saying you engage in the sin in it. But when I'm talking about you already did your big sins and you're done, you hope you never do them again and you're completely throwing yourself at the mercy of God, the next step is to see who he is for you. 
And that's what we, that's what Romans 8 is. It's the journey into the Father's heart to see that you can submit to God and he's not against you. He's for you. And when you realize that, you're able to submit to your circumstances, in your circumstances. No, I don't know how to change my circumstances. I can't make them better. If I try, it's out of my own foolishness and I'll just produce another set of circumstances that are more consequences. That's what got me in trouble in the first place. This is what transformation is. The renewing of the mind to where you actually acknowledge who God is and know who he is and submit to him. And you're now the prodigal son walking with the father while being encouraged by the spirit, the, the woman. And uh, she's not a woman, but that in the parable, you know, uh, and, and being carried by the shepherd, which that's the way we go. If you're not being carried by the shepherd and you're walking yourself, you're going to go off the path. And if it's not the spirit searching you to give you wisdom, then you're going to come up with your own carnal mind concepts. And if it's not the father walking you home, no one has the authority to let you in the house and give you the feast and tell you the ser- tell the servants to make sure you get fed. We need to be totally submitted to God, and we will not be as long as we think he's against us. And that's what Paul's talking about in Corinthians. Be reconciled to God. He's not counting your trespasses against you. They were so carnal. They had so many sins that were against them and that was defiling their conscience and keeping them from coming forward to him. Why? Because of their ignorance, because of their unbelief. What do they need? A vision of Christ. And that vision can't come unless Christ actually visits you. We can't, we'll, we'll see that in Genesis with Abraham. It, Abraham's knowledge of who God is and his ability to walk forward every time was first uh, supplied by a visit from God. The God of glory visited him and gave him a vision and spoke to him. And see, this is what happens. I say, I have no idea how I stopped all the sins I used to sin. I haven't been on porn sites in years. I mean, seriously, you know. And every guy, that's a major struggle. Now, I say that in fear and trembling because I know what's in my flesh. I'm not boasting in that as if I've accomplished anything. What I'm saying is I don't understand the mercy of God that took me away from those behaviors. Okay, that is the shepherd carrying me. That There's a fundamental thing where you just recognize that if God doesn't, can't carry me out, then I'm not getting out. But then as he starts to carry you out, and he will... You will see as you are agreed with him. He's for me. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm predestinated. It turns out I'm saved after all, even though I'm this big of a sinner. You got to get that right in your mind. You know, that you have assurance you have eternal life and agree with God's testimony concerning his son and let that which you heard from the beginning abide in you. And this is the message we heard, the promise, eternal life. He has given you eternal life. That how do you know you have eternal life? Because you believe on the Son. <laughs> the witness of the Spirit never left you, even when you were in your big sin. That's why you couldn't run away. You know, you wanted to be able to sin without thinking about God. Eventually, just leave me to my sin so I can do what I want without having to think about the consequences of this. Nope. That's why it's so miserable. There's no such thing as a Christian just doing whatever they want to do and being happy. <laughs> uh You know, we do eventually do what we want to do, which is to submit ourselves to God and wait for him to raise us up. But then we have to agree that he predestinated everything. And he even brought me through that whole journey, knowing that I was going to fail, knowing he gave, you know, the prodigal son, the father gave him the inheritance. He shouldn't have done that. He gave him the inheritance. He was still alive. That's not even legal. Uh, no, the father didn't tempt him to sin, but he knew that the son, what was working in the son's heart was, give me my inheritance. You know, when you say to dad, give me my inheritance, you know there's something wrong with the relationship. And yet he gave it to him. Why? Because he needed him to go through all of that. What? 
He needed to allow man to fall. He needed to have the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden. Some people say, why did God even put that in there or allow that to be in there? Everything would have been perfect. Because there is a wisdom that we gain where God's attributes are put on display. And there is a side of him that we don't, we wouldn't know otherwise. And, and I've talked about this before that, you know, in Peter it says that uh, we're brought into a state of rejoicing full of, we haven't seen him, but we love him. We rejoice uh, with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Receiving the end of our uh, faith, the salvation of our souls, of which salvation the angels inquire into. And Paul talks about communion, that the women wear head coverings. No, it's not an ordinance. But the reason they do it is an understanding that the angels are watching this. The angels, and according to Ephesians 3, uh, it says that God is making known his manifold wisdom in the church to the principalities according to his eternal purpose. In other words, God knew from the beginning what he was going to do, and he did it this way to put certain things about himself on display through his work in the church. And uh, foremost, the riches of the glory of his grace, which he's putting on display by bringing us under the sonship, bringing these worms, this worm Jacob, to transform him to become Israel, the heir. To bring Meshev, Mephibosheth, <laughs> uh, the lame, halt, poor, homeless guy, and, and establish the covenant he made with Jonathan and put Mephibosheth in the inheritance and put him in the t at the table eating in the king's house. What is that a display of? It's a display of his mercy. It's a display of his righteousness, it's his faithfulness to his covenant, his faithfulness to his word, his faithfulness to, uh, that's David's faithfulness, but it's a picture of God. God is showing, see the angels, they knew God was powerful and glorious and holy and they were made minister servants and whatever he commanded, they did. They were created to execute it. Why? Because that's what they do. But now through the fall of man and the incarnation, God is putting things on display that they would have never even thought of before. What is compassion? What is weakness? What is tender mercies? What is reconciliation? What is humiliation? You know, Jesus was humiliated <laughs> to become a servant, to become in the likeness of men. Uh, to be found fashioned in a man and even die the death of a criminal. To What is condescending? To condescend to a low estate. To, to partake of flesh and blood so that he could taste death for all of us and bring us into glory. What is his perfect patience and mercy towards sinners? God justifying the ungodly. Who work not but believe on him who justifies the ungodly. Uh, but believe, you know. What does it mean to walk by faith? The angels see God. We walk by faith, and yet we love him because of his love for us in a way that they can't even understand. Now, yes, he's displaying all this to the angels, and Christ is what's being put on display. Christ is being manifested as God's righteousness and his propitiation of our sins, justifying God so that he is just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. Even though he works not, he's ungodly, he's an enemy of God. God is just. He has the authority to reconcile himself to us and reconcile us to himself and establish peace and even bring us into the inheritance. To glorify us and predestinate us to be sons of God in glory, brothers of Christ, co-heirs with him. See how important it is to understand that the inheritance is secured by justification? When I, One of the reasons I stayed in sin was because once I did my big sins, I thought God was done with me. I had disqualified myself for the inheritance, even though I was technically still saved. And so I knew I was saved, but couldn't go on in my Christian life because I thought God was done. But the good news about predestination is God's never done. You may say, leave me alone. He says, no, I'm not leaving you alone. I'm already working for you. But what he wants is for you to be reconciled to him in your mind. So that you learn these attributes that he's putting on display through his redemption. 
So he is glorifying Christ through your bad journey. No, he's not the author of your bad journey. He allows it, though. And because he's what, what he's going to work out of it and through it. And there's no such thing as a Christian who's sinned so far that God can never use him again. And he's disqualified himself for the reward. Because the 11th hour laborer gets the same wage as the guy who's been working all the way through. Our reward is based on the generosity of the Lord. Now we lose some opportunities, you know. And I don't need to get into all that again. But the point is, you are not useless to God. He's not given up on you. He is still working in you, but you need to submit yourself to him until you can get a vision. And he's going to give it to you. That's part of his reconciling. He's interceding for you in your weakness, and he's bringing ministry to you to describe the riches of the glory of his grace that's made you accepted in the beloved. You've got to get that agreed with. And then you have to see, okay, I just got out of jail and I'm living in this guy's basement and I don't have a job. I don't even know if I'm employable. My family doesn't talk to me anymore. I'm just, I just, I don't know who that is. That's not me. But that could be somebody. Is God done with you? No. The son who was in the pig slop working for a wage, uh, you know, for the pig farmer who originally went down with all the money and could do whatever he wanted. Now he's working for the guy, you know. God's not done with him. You are not checkmated. You may think you're checkmated, but that's when resurrection is made available. When you are put to an end of yourself, now God can start to express his life in a more and more open way. Uh, We talk about our death with Christ because I always say that the next person allowed to move in the tomb is Christ, the risen one. And we're raised together with him. It's his life that God wants to manifest, and he can't while you are not reconciled to him and waiting on him, and you're still spinning your wheels trying to make things work for yourself. That's what the prodigal son was trying to do. He was trying to make make the inheritance. He wanted it so he could go out and make things work for himself according to his own rules. When we're reconciled to God, we finally agree with all his judgments on sin, on the flesh, his condemnation on the flesh, that it's crucified. But that doesn't cloud our vision that he's for us, that he loves us, that my journey didn't separate me from him, and now he's even using the consequences of my life for my good to write a story that I couldn't have written. And you'll see if you're in that marriage uh, that I was talking about, 10 years from now, you'll see the blessing God works in your life through it. If you don't try to get up and run, you know, just stay still. Don't move until you know God's leading you in a direction. And you don't count your suffering in the equation. You know, you may be suffering because of the consequences. And this is where a lot of people start reasoning. Well, if I'm suffering, then there must be something I can do to alleviate the situation. And then they start coming with questions like, well, is it God's will if I, what if I leave? And they they start accusing the spouse of more than what they're even guilty of in order to justify their next bad decision they're going to make. No, stop. Stop making decisions for yourself. Instead, start absorbing, really, the truth of God's word. And stop eating food from the pig trough. Although the rapture channels that are set in dates and having dreams, and practicing gematria and various forms of witchcraft and divination in the name of Christ, while backloading works, and then rebuking us for not supposedly loving the Lord's appearing, are not... The food you need to be eating. You need to be brought to the feast. You've got to cleave to the New Testament ministry. You have to separate yourself from error. A lot of people come because their life is a mess. They came to YouTube and they're looking for comfort. And each day they get a little morsel, but they're still lying down there in the pig slop. Some of the food's good. Some of it's bad. They'll eat anything. They're starving. The one thing you can do is judge what you're eating. And say, okay, I'm only going to eat the food that actually nourishes me with Christ and supplies me with him and reconciles me to him and shows me that he's who I am as a child. Identification truths is what we call it. What is yours because of your position in Christ apart from your condition, no matter how bad it is, because God's for his heirs. 
Okay, I have to go. Hopefully this is uh, uh, as I intended it. <laughs>